When you give your heart to Jesus, he takes your heart and keeps that in his heart where nothing, absolutely nothing and no one can shake you. You are secure in him. Most of you sitting here today, I'm looking around, I'm seeing most of you here have experienced that. And so now it's time for people like us who have experienced that to share this experience with other people. We can't keep that to ourselves. Look around you. The world is going more and more to destruction and in a place that is just so hopeless that it's our duty to step in and say, we have the solution. We have a hope that you know, surpasses all of these things. It's a hope that anchors us. It's a hope that gives us a, a reassurance to keep going. Next week, for example, we just mentioned it a few moments ago, we're hosting a two-day event with Dr. Hugh Ross. As Chris mentioned, a famous astrophysicist. Um, why are we hosting this event? Why? Just because we're bored? Because we had nothing better to do? Because we think it'll increase our clout, our branding? No, there's a reason we're, in, we're bringing Dr. Hugh Ross here. Because we know that people need to experience Christ. We know that. And for some people, one of the barriers that prevents them from experiencing Christ, from being open to accept Christ, is this misconception in their minds of science and God. There is that misconception in people's minds that God and science cannot coexist, that they're, you know, God and, and, and the Bible are at odds with each other. There's a contradiction there. They, they cannot be you know, in harmony. So we have organized a weekend to help break those misconceptions, to break the barriers that are in people's minds. Why? Why are we doing that? Because we want them to be open to receive Christ, to accept Christ, to experience Christ. But some people have a barrier, and that for them may be science. Maybe for you it wasn't that. Maybe it was something else for you. But for every person, there is something that's holding them back from really opening themselves up and, say, and saying, you know what, yes, I, I want Jesus. I want this life. I want this relationship. And so we should change the way we think of these events like Dr. Hugh Ross coming. It's not just for, you know, I don't know, to amuse ourselves or to hear some interesting information. There's a purpose behind it. We want people to come here, people who may have these wrong ideas, these misconceptions, these blockages and barriers in their minds. We want them to come and to hear and understand that, you know what, the Bible and science actually are very much in harmony. They're, you know, God uh, supports science and science supports God. And so through that, that's an opportunity then to, to make an impact, to talk to them and say, now that you've put those misconceptions aside, can I tell you about the person of Christ? Can I tell you the message of the Bible? Can I give you something that is a, a, an anchor for your life? So let's pray about that and, and change the way we sometimes think about these kinds of events. So that's enough about the why. I've covered why we need to have an impact. There's a lot happening in the world, and God even has called us to have an impact, and Christ was an example to us of having an impact. So we understand the why, but how? How do we have an impact? And I put a verse up here, actually, which, um, again, is from Hebrews and is a reminder of what I just said about Christ being that anchor, that hope which anchors us. So God wants us to be a people of impact. But God doesn't just want individuals to have an impact. He's looking for a collective impact. Now you may ask, well, what's wrong with an individual person having an impact? Like, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But, um, and as I said, it's true that individuals, they can have a great impact. And we see that actually in the Bible. Many, many examples are in the Bible of individual people who have an impact for Christ or an impact in general uh, for God's purpose. Some are in the Old Testament. I'm sure you can think of many people like Abraham, people like Jacob, people like Joseph. Could we not all agree that they have a tremendous impact on people's lives? Uh, people like King David and the prophets of the Old Testament. Um, but there are also some in the, in the New Testament. I'm sure you can think of obviously Jesus being the most obvious one. But other than Jesus, people like John the Baptist, Mary, uh, the apostles like John and Peter and Paul, all of them have had such an amazing impact. Uh, that extends to today, but they are sing individuals who had an impact. Just one of them has managed to impact the world in a way that is, is, you know, we've never been the same with these characters having come, David writing those beautiful psalms and le leading such an exemplar exemplary life, not in his, you know, actions, but in the heart that he had for God. 
that, that is a lasting impact that when you read the life of David, you're like, wow, look at this person. I may have a lot of mistakes, a lot of faults, but I, can I have a heart like David? And people like Apostle Paul, I mean, I don't, I don't even need to say more. For those of you who know, Apostle Paul is one of the reasons we are here today. He planted all those churches in Asia Minor and, and elsewhere, and he was truly a pillar in, in God's kingdom, in God's plan. And so imagine if you had a thousand of Apostle Paul. Imagine if you had a thousand of King David. So the greater the vessel, the greater the impact. The potential is greater for impact. So it's, it's very easy then to understand that the more of us that come together with this common purpose or common cause, the more that impact can be magnified and multiplied. But there's a catch, and I'll get to that in a moment. So you and I, those of us who are here, we're members of this church, um, we should be looking for ways to, to see how our individual impact can fit within the greater impact our church can have. Meaning, so I, I literally wrote it up there. How can I, ask yourself, how can I make a difference in the impact that my church has? And it's a question we have to ask ourselves. And it, it applies to, from the youngest to the oldest in our church. It's not just something for people who've been here for 40 years. You can be here for the first time in our church and ask yourself this. How can I make a difference in the impact that my church has on people's lives? Because again, as I said, I don't want to diminish the importance of individual impact, but imagine all of us coming together for a common purpose, a common goal, moving as one, taking actions together. Can you imagine the impact we can have on people's lives? I mean, we've seen it already. I'm not saying that we're not doing that, but imagine being more intentional about it. Imagine that it be at the forefront of our minds. Imagine that be something that is our focus. I can't even, like, I can't even quite imagine what the impact would really be because it can be so great. It can be so great. How do I know that? I'll tell you how I know. There are some always examples in the Bible. Joshua. Many different examples, but I chose a couple. If you go to the Old Testament, there's a story of Joshua. Joshua, if you've seen the movie Prince of Egypt, which is one of my favorite cartoons, I made my boyfriend watch it a few months ago and he loved it too, and it, it does help to have some visuals. But anyways, if you've ever watched the Ten Commandment movie or if you've watched Prince of Egypt, it's great, but the Prince of Egypt movie ends right when they make it outside of Egypt, you know, God calls Moses, Moses goes into the, to Egypt, helps free God's people, they come out, they cross the Red Sea, everyone's happy, and then what? Right? The movie finishes, so you, what's the rest of the story? So Joshua, I'm not going to get into details, but after a very long time of wandering in the wilderness, it's 40 years, these people have been liberated and they're wandering and wandering. Uh, after 40 years, God tells Joshua and Caleb, he raises these two younger people, these, a new generation, to take God's people into the promised land. The, the reason he even brought them out in the first place. So Joshua, when they went in the land, it wasn't just, you know, okay, we're just going to go conquer and take it, you know, walk into this land and start pitching our tents. No, they, they went in, they scoped the land, and they saw that there were a lot of enemy nations there, a lot of uh, nations and groups of people that were, at, you know, that were antagonistic, that they were not, uh, you know, going to be so happy about God's people moving into that land. So what happens? One of the examples we read is the story of Jericho. And it's, it's a very common story. And a lot of people know it. But to kind of summarize, Joshua is leading all these people. And they come to this walled fortress, this city called Jericho. And basically, these walls at that time, I don't know how tall they were. But you can imagine, it's not very easy to penetrate and to conquer a city that is walled. Usually, that at that time, if you had a walled city, that was their source of protection and security. So what God tells them is go around the walls of Jericho, not just Joshua. He doesn't tell, okay, Joshua, you just go walk around and then all the walls will come down. No, all the people, women and children and everything they have, they march around the walls of Jericho seven times. And that was the cause of Jericho. Like, again, I'm not going to get into all the details, but Jericho collapsed. After those seven days, those seven times that they went around that, that walled city, God gave them victory over that city. But why did he give them victory? It wasn't just because Joshua went around. It was the, all the people of God going around Jericho. So there was a collective impact. 
There was a group of people having a common purpose, a common goal, saying, okay, we're coming to take over the land. We're coming to conquer the land. God's going to give us the victory, but we still got to do something here. And so together, united, they went around, 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 and finally the walls came down. That's an Old Testament example. What about a New Testament example? Pentecost. Pentecost. That one is a very, very clear example, again, of the, of the, uh, the magnification, I don't know if that's a word, the, how impact can be magnified and multiplied when you have a group. So on the day of Pentecost, for those of you who don't know, this is the day that really the church was born, and 120 people were in an upper room together. Uh, Peter and the other disciples or apostles, they were all there together, and um, it says in the Bible that they were of one mind and one heart. There was such a unity there among the people, 120 of them, such a unity that in that unity, because of that unity and coming together, agreeing together, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but it didn't end there. They didn't just have that moment, you know, happy time, yay, Holy Spirit. Then they went out. They went out of the upper room, they went onto the streets, and they started to preach the gospel. They started to tell people the message of Christ about the good news of salvation that Christ can give us. And that same day, if I'm not mistaken, like what, 3,000 people came to believe in that one day? And you have to understand, uh, it's not like today where you can post something on TikTok and it can go viral in two seconds, or on your Instagram or on Facebook, where it's so easy to have an impact in two seconds. 3,000 people at that time, that's a big impact for people who were only sharing things by word of mouth, okay? There was no, no megaphone, there was no stage, there was no microphones, there was people interacting with people. And so in one day, 3,000 people came to believe because of 120. So we can clearly see that when a people come together in that unity and agreement for a common cause or purpose, the impact can be so great. And that's what God is after. He wants a collective impact. He didn't just say, okay, Peter, stay in a room. I'm going to, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You are going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you alone are going to go out onto the streets and start preaching the gospel. No, he didn't say that to just Peter or to just John or one of the other apostles. He said that to all of them, to be in that upper room together. And that's where we see how important collective impact is. So those are just two examples I brought. And I put on screen here, you know, because of those 120, you and I are here today, actually, because 120 back then went out and started telling everyone and started preaching the gospel. They started telling the good news of Christ. And you and I are the beneficiaries of that today. The church it started on that day that the 120 were filled with the Spirit and went out. So, you know, we have a lot to thank for that 120 that stood and were firm and went out and told people. So today, I, I Google, there's like over 2.6 billion people today that, you know, supposedly are, are, are Christian. So imagine from 120 to 2.6 billion just in, in present days. I'm not even counting over the last 2,000, 2000 years. Just today, we're at 2.6 billion Christians around the world. So you can see what just a small group of people united can do in terms of impact. So as you see from those examples, collective action leads to collective impact. And it's so important that we talk about this as a church because it really applies to all of us. So as I said, these are all very important concepts, but practically speaking, how do we as a church, all of us are sitting here, how do we as a church have that collective impact? What are the steps or necessary requirements that must be in place in order to have a collective impact? I kind of alluded to some when I was just giving those examples, but I want to break them down for you. What are some of the necessary steps or requirements in order for us as a church to have a collective impact? Huros is just the beginning, guys. We need to get out there. We need to have an impact as a church. How do we do that? Well, first, it starts with a common agenda. Simple as that. It starts with a common agenda or purpose. What does that even mean? Well, a common agenda means we need to collectively identify a problem and agree on a shared vision to solve that problem. So what is our problem today in the world? The world needs God. It's as simple as that. We overcomplicate 
everything. It's as simple as the world needs God. Now, what's our vision? What should be our shared vision as a church? Show Christ to the world. Simple. We overcomplicate everything. What this book boils down to is those two things. The problem of the world today is the world needs God. The world doesn't have God. It's a godless world. What should we as a church, what should our vision be? Show Christ to the world. And I put here a verse, it's from 1 Timothy uh, 2, 5, that says, there is only one God and there is only one way that people can reach God. That way is through Jesus Christ. Very simple. So we have to agree as a church, this is our common agenda, our common purpose, our common vision. We want to show Christ to the world, starting from our own families, our own friends, our own you know, communities, colleagues, whoever they may be, the people we touch and interact every single day. We need to show Christ to these people because the world needs God, right? Can we all agree with that? To back it all up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I have some verses here. Lest you think I'm just saying it, it's in the Word. It's in the Word. Uh, so here's some verses. The first one. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I beg all of you to agree with each other. You should not be divided into different groups. Be completely joined together again with the same kind of thinking and the same purpose. Get on the same page. That's what he's saying. We need to be united. We need to be on the same page around that common vision, that common agenda. We want to show Christ to the world. We want to express Christ to the world. We want to preach the truth that is in the Bible so that people can experience Christ. People need to experience Christ. And so we have to be all on the same page about that. We can't be divided about that vision. It needs to be something we all say yes. It's a common agenda that we all share. Next verse, Philippians. Actually, Chris brought this one to my attention. Another great verse. Now, the important thing is that your way of life should be as the gospel of Christ requires, so that whether or not I am able to go and see you, this is Paul talking, I will hear that you are standing firm with one common purpose, and that with only one desire, you are fighting together for the faith of the gospel. Beautiful. I mean, you can just unpack this verse into so many parts, but the part I, I bolded there, standing firm with one common purpose. This is Apostle Paul saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's Apostle Paul saying, as a church, he's writing to the, to the believers, the Christians in, in, in Philippi, the Philippian believers. He was saying, you got to have a common purpose that you stand firm on together. We have moved to this new location. We are talking about different plans, different this and this and this. Before we even make plans, before we even do this and that, we have to come united together with a common vision a common agenda. We can't be on different pages as a church. And that can easily happen. I'll get to that. So number two, what's our second requirement? Second requirement for a church or a group of people to have an impact for Christ is we must establish a shared measurement. What does that mean? A shared measurement. Meaning that once we agree on a common agenda, we have to agree on a way of measuring our progress toward that goal. How do we do that? Simple. How do we do that? How do we have a shared measurement? We have to have a shared measurement. Um, our shared measurement is Christ, actually. Christ is the indication of our progress. The more we become like Christ, the closer we are to our goal. How does that serve our common goal or agenda? The more we become like Christ, the more we are showing Christ to the world. It's as simple as that. The more I become like Christ, the more I am displaying his characteristics, the more I have developed his character in, in me, the more I am transformed to be like Christ, the more I'm showing him to the world. Because when they interact with me, they're interacting with Christ, right? This is our shared measurement. It should be our shared measurement as a church where we all agree and we say, okay, how do we measure, you know, whether we are making progress towards that goal. It's as simple as all of us agreeing that our shared measure is going to be Christ. We are having that as our standard. We want to all have Christ, uh, you know, reflected in and through us, expressed in and through us. And by that happening, that's where people 
are exposed to Christ. That's where people come in contact with the person of Christ. So this has to be our shared measurement. And our church talks a lot about, th about this concept, whether we use the word conformity, transformation, you know, image and likeness. These are words that all come to mean one thing. We need to agree we, that we have a shared measurement of what is our progress. Our progress is Christ. Christ is that measure that we want to reach and attain. And by reaching that, that's how we know we are progressively exposing people to Christ more and more. We're showing who he is to the people around us. I hope that's clear, but I've, I've put a verse here that um, kind of speaks to that from Ephesians. Again, Apostle Paul is writing to believers in, in Ephesians saying, and he gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to make uh, to mature manhood to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is what we want. We want to reach that measure, that fullness of Christ. All that Christ is in his humanity, as a human, all his characteristics, we want those to be our characteristics. We want those to be working in us and through us so that when people come in contact with us, they're not just coming in contact with Stephanie, they may see me, but the person interacting with them through me is Christ because his characteristics are coming out, his love, his compassion, his grace, right? So this is our shared measurement, or it should be. Number three, the third requirement is that there must be conditions. Sorry. Third requirement is that there must be conditions or an environment in, in place for different but coordinated activities. This is very important. This is very, very important. Different but coordinated activities. What does that mean? It means we all have different functions in the, in the collective, but these different functions have to all be coordinated, meaning that they all have to work toward our common goal. All have to work toward our common goal. I'll give you an example, our Sunday services, right? So if our goal in having these Sunday services, um, like the one you know, today, is for people to come and experience God. That, that's what we want, right? This is an environment we're coming here together for people to experience God. And if that's our goal, we want them to experience his love, hear about his, his truth through his word, you know, hear about his plan and purpose for their lives, to, to hear the message of hope. That's, that's our goal. We want people to experience all of that. So there's a lot that has to go into making that possible, right? So we have an ushering team, they come, they open the doors, they have to, you know, turn lights on, they have to get things ready and set up. You know, then our audiovisual and media team comes, they set things up. The fact that you can hear me today is because somebody has set up a microphone. Somebody has set up the audiovisual system here so that you can hear me clearly, that you could hear the worship team that was singing and playing. The worship team, as I mentioned, they, they lead us in songs. These songs are not just for us to mechanically sing. They're, they're creating an environment for impact to happen, for people to hear the words and be touched, to see, wow, how much God loves me. Wow, God's grace is so you know, uh, powerful that it's, it's, it's the reason that I can run to God now and say, I'm sorry, but you've accepted me and you've forgiven me. Like All of those can come through in a song. People can be touched by the words of a song. So um, other people may be not necessarily visible, but they may be praying for our services before, you know, privately. We, we don't know, but all of these are different, but coordinated activities. And I'm speaking, this is very practical. What I'm just sharing right now is very practical church life examples that I'm giving you of what does it mean to have different functions, but all of them work towards the same goal, the same common purpose. Our purpose in for Sunday services is for people to experience Christ, people to experience his love people to hear the message of the gospel, right? But I may be doing one part, others are doing their part, but we all have a court, we're coordinated towards that goal. We're all saying we have that common purpose, we are going to do everything towards that purpose, and so we're all doing different functions. And last week, if you were here, Adrian brought up some very nice verses about uh, that Apostle Paul uses to describe the body. He uses the human body as an example, and I will too where we have a body, you're seeing one entity, you're seeing one unit, but I have many parts. The body has many parts. We have the lungs, we have the heart, we have the brain, we have you know, fingers and, and toes and all that. Each one of those parts of me have a different function. My heart is not doing the same thing as my mind. 
My fingers don't do the same thing as my knees. Every single part does its own thing, but it's all coordinated. It's all coordinated with one common goal. Our bodies keep us alive, right? The goal is for this person to stay alive. The, the blood has to flow through the body, right? Everything has, every organ, every cell in your body is working to keep you alive and functioning. So the same has to apply in the body of Christ. Within the church, we all have to find, first of all, discover our function, discover where we fit, what is my part, what is my part that I bring to the big picture, to the collective. And once we've discovered our function or our, the part that we can bring into this bigger collective, then we have to say, are we coordinated? Are we all going towards the same function or I'm um, sorry, the same common purpose? So it is something we have to ask ourselves because a lot of churches could be doing a lot of different things, but is it all serving the common goal? Is it all serving that common purpose? And it's something that we as a church, we're not immune. We need to ask ourselves that. How does, again, do you remember what I put in the beginning? How does my individual impact fit within the collective impact that my church can have? So that's something we have to, as individuals, ask ourselves, and then also as a church, ask ourselves, are we making room for different functions in the body? And if we have these different functions, are they serving that common goal that we have, that we want every person to experience the person of Christ, to come to experience his salvation and the hope that I talked about? So again, we don't all have to do the same thing, but we do need to work together. Another verse, uh, I brought this up earlier, and this also applies to what I'm just saying here, which is, again, Ephesians uh, 4, verses 11 to 13, that says, and he gave the apostles prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. You see how many different functions there are? He didn't just say, and he gave, you know, pastors. He gave apostles. No, he gave multiple different functions within the body of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, so many different functions. But what, what is it all? He, he takes it somewhere. He says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ. So all of those different functions have to serve the common purpose, have to have a, a common agenda, right? It's not just that we all have a different function. Next verse says, again, as I, I brought up, that I'm not going to read all of it, but basically here Apostle Paul in, in uh, the first letter to the Corinthian believers, he says, and a person's body has more than one part. It has many parts. And here he, he kind of just says what I said about, you know, the foot not being the ear, the ear not being the foot, and different, you know, different organs and members of our body, they all have a, a purpose for being there. They all have a part to play, but they all serve one common uh, agenda or purpose, which takes us to the next verse, 1 Corinthians 18 uh, to 23, verses 18 to 23. Sorry, I don't think I have the verse, uh, the chapter here, but anyways, it says, if each part of the body were the same part, there would be no, no body. But as it is, God uh, put the parts in the body as he wanted them. He made a place for each one. That's such a beautiful verse. It says God intentionally made a place for each one. So each of us being here, we have a place that God has made for us in that body. He has intentionally done this. It's not by accident, haphazardly. Oh, my place was just, it just happened to be there. No, he has intentionally made a place for each of us to bring our parts into this collective. So number four, the fourth requirement is that in order to have collective impact, you must have continuous communication. And this may seem obvious, but I'm going to give some examples as to what that really means. So continuous communication means that we have to build relationships with each other and develop those relationships. We cannot have a collective impact with, uh, without continuous communication. We can't because continuous communication builds trust builds accountability, it strengthens our unity. Um, but you may say, okay, well, how do we have this continuous communication? What does that really mean, practically speaking? Showing up to church is one way we have a continuous communication. Sorry, let's go back to the previous one. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is, is showing up to church, getting plugged into ministries. That's another way we keep that dialogue, that communication and the unity strong between one another. Joining a prayer group, it was announced earlier that we have at least two prayer groups, right? There, are, there could be more. Uh, calling each other during the week, texting each other, 
whatever, you know, whatever method you prefer, but that's constant communication. Grabbing coffee with a fellow, you know, member of the church. Hit them up, go grab a coffee. Uh, joining a cell group or a growth group. These are just some, some of the ways that you can uh, be in constant communication with other people in the church, with other members of the body. But that is so vital. It's so important for us to be constantly in the flow together, that we're communicating, communicating together. And one verse that, I, again, uh, was, was from Hebrews that I thought it was very interesting, but again, speaks to what I was just saying. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's interesting how it's saying basically, you know, in these end times, as we, we come closer and closer to the, to the second coming of Christ, we're going to see a lot of people falling away, not meeting. That's, that's what he's saying. It's the, as is the habit of some. That's kind of sad to hear that already at that time, that was already, that pattern or that behavior was already setting into the church. But it's being highlighted for us here how important it is that we don't neglect to meet. And that meeting doesn't always have to be in person. Sometimes it's just a text, it's a call, it's constantly being in communication with one another because that strengthens that unity. It strengthens our common goal. It strengthens why we do, we do what we do as a church. So it's, not, it's something maybe very obvious, but are we, we have to ask ourselves, am I neglecting to be in that constant communication? Could I find more ways to be in communication, to be plugged in to the body? Lastly, collective impact requires strong backbone support. What does that mean? Backbone support. Meaning something or someone dedicated to aligning and supporting the work of the group. You need backbone support. For us, the Holy Spirit is the person who provides all the help, all the support that we need to make sure that our efforts and activities all serve that common goal. This is what it really boils down to. You, we can do a lot of planning. We can do a lot of this and that. We can work out logistics. We can come together. We can do this and that. If the Holy Spirit is not our backbone support, these efforts are in vain. Simple as that. There will be no true and lasting collective impact from God's perspective. And why do I say that? I'll get to that in a moment. But it is very important that when we come together, and I said all those different steps, common agenda, shared measurement, you know, collected, uh, uh, continuously being in communication, blah, blah, blah. It boils down to all this. Backbone support must be there from the Holy Spirit. And there's a verse in John where Jesus himself says, but the helper calls him the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. So we know out of Jesus' own mouth, he said that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is our helper. So the important thing is, are, is, all, is all that we're doing with him included? Are we doing it in harmony, in unity with the Holy Spirit? So to better understand all of these five steps or the requirements for collective impact, I've created a slide that shows in green what we should be doing, which is what I just spent time explaining, versus what kills collective impact is in the black. To, uh, like what, if you want to know what prevents a church from having a collective impact from God's perspective, look at that list. Look at that list. Specialized agendas. Fragmented measurements. Independent activities. Sporadic communication. Unsupported efforts. I don't know about you, but... I hate to say this, but could we look at that list and, and agree that we see this very much operational in a lot of churches today? And again, I'm not saying this from a place of judgment. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not here to judge any Christian or any church. But it is a warning even for us. It is a warning to all Christians, all churches, that we may agree that it is important to have collective impact. We may even come together to, to have that impact, to try to make that happen. But very easily, a lot of different things can happen. We can start having specialized agendas. This part, this part of the church wants to do this thing. This part of the church wants to do that thing. Every, everyone's on a different page. Everybody has a different purpose, a different agenda. We're seeing a lot of that in the church today at large. I'm not saying just, you know, our church, but 
the church at large, we see a lot of specialized agenda. Everybody has their own agenda. Fragmented measurements. Is everybody on the same page about what it means to really meet that goal of, of expressing Christ? No, everybody has a different idea of what it means to, to really make impact. There's all these fragmented measurements. Independent activities. I love this one because everybody is doing their own thing. There are a lot of churches that even within the same church, everyone's on a different page. Everybody's on a different page. They're not really bringing their part to, to have one coordinated movement, one coordinated activity. A lot of fragmented, independent activities all happening at the same time. Sporadic communication. A lot of sporadic communication. Lack of fellowship. Lack of that being plugged into that same flow of life. That same you know, communication that is, that is really at the heart of what a church needs to be. It's, it's not only communication with up, you know, vertically between us and God. It's this way too. It's horizontally as well. And lastly, this one really got to me. Unsupported efforts. I was thinking to myself, could there be churches that have unsupported efforts where the Holy Spirit is not is not their backbone support. There is no support or like a, a seal of, of, you know, blessing or seal of approval from the Holy Spirit. And then I remembered that unfortunately that is very possible that even we read in, in scriptures that it says that, you know, at, at the time Jesus comes, there will be people who will tell Jesus, well, in your name, we prophesied, we taught, we did this, we did that. A lot of churches today could say, you know, we led this many crusades in your name, Jesus. We had this many revival meetings in your name, Jesus. We had this many Bible studies in your name, Jesus. We had this many people come to believe. You know, we had this many baptisms, this many this and that, that, that. They'll, they'll come up with a whole list of, of activities, of effort, right? But then what did Jesus say? If those, for those of you who are familiar with that passage, Jesus said, I don't know you. That's scary. So it is possible to be a church and have unsupported efforts where the Holy Spirit is not a partner with you in that collective Im impact. The Holy Spirit is not, is not giving that seal of approval from the Lord saying, yes, this is where you need to be, what you need to do, go forth, go do. And that's scary because a lot of people will come and give their full list of all their accomplishments. Um, again, I'm not here to judge anyone, but I'm saying we have to be careful as a church because we can fall in the same trap. We can also, we're not immune. There is nothing that we are immune to. So we have to really take a moment to say, Lord, are you fully approving everything we're doing? Are you a partner with us in all our efforts? Are you our backbone support that is helping us to you know, align everything with God's mind? So we have to ask ourselves because we don't want to be a church of unsupported efforts. I've, I said this at, at the conference and I said this to my family. If I ever get the courage, I want to write a book called The Church of Unsupported Efforts because there's a lot of churches that, that are doing a lot, but that doesn't mean that in God's eyes, in God's perspective, they are doing that with the support of the Holy Spirit in line with God's mind, God's will, what God's purpose is, but they're doing. So we have to be careful that we don't do what's on the on, on the you know, the, the black bubbles and we do what's in the green. We got to be careful, prayerfully. As we say, yes, Lord, we are now in a position that we all understand and we agree. We want to have a collective impact as a church. We need to pray and come before the Lord and say, help us to be a church of supported efforts, a church with the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the, a church where the, the Lord goes before us. The Lord is before us. He's beside us. He is behind us. He is with us all the way fully supporting us, saying, yes, go out, go do. So we need to pray about that. Um, now, to wrap up everything that I'm saying, again, it's, it's really important to give examples, I feel. Um, I'm going to show you through a case study uh, how all of these concepts, these were all concepts I just told you, how all of these concepts that I spoke actually apply. How can they actually be operational? Basically, Talk is cheap, right? I could be saying all this, but does it actually, you know, can we see that happen in real life? How, what are, how do we see that these requirements or steps uh, work in action? So, Nehemiah, this is the case study that I want to bring to your attention because I think it's a beautiful illustration, really beautiful. So who is Nehemiah? I'm going to give a little 30-second spiel for those who don't know. 
Nehemiah was uh, somebody who we read about in, in the Old Testament. He lived in the Persian Empire um, when the Persian Empire had conquered the Babylonian Empire. So he lived in the Persian Empire and was the cupbearer for the king, or as my dad commonly says, he was the king's personal bartender, okay? That's what he was. He was the bartender for the king. I can't take credit for that joke. That's not mine. So Nehemiah was part of a, a minority Jewish population that was living in the Persian Empire at that time. We obviously know he had you know, a close proximity to the king. Um, and so when Nehemiah heard of the destruction uh, or, or the ruins that Jerusalem was in, Jerusalem was, was the ancestral home of his people. That's where they came from. He was from that land. So when he heard that Jerusalem is lying in ruins, it's a ruined city, rubble everywhere, and it's just desecrated, it broke his heart. It really made him sad. And so because he was in such close proximity to the king, the king noticed, hey, you're down. What's going on? I see your face and you're not, you know, you're not looking too happy. So Nehemiah tells him, you know, this burden in his heart that his city, his ancestral home is lying in ruins. And so the king says, okay, you've got my blessing. Go out, do what you need to do, get your people and rebuild the city. Okay. So that's kind of the, the scene. I'm laying the, the, the foundation for why Nehemiah then goes back to, to the city of Jerusalem. He sees, okay, everything is in ruins. And so what happens? The story is really beautiful. Please go back and read it, but I'm going, going to show just some verses. So the first one, how do we see these requirements in action? Common agenda, right? That was our first one. What was their common agenda? When Nehemiah arrived, he got the people together. What was their common agenda? Simple, build the walls of the city. They all came together. And what does the verse say? Nehemiah 2 verses 17 to 18. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. You see, it wasn't just Nehemiah. It said they came together and they agreed and they replied at once, yes. Let's rebuild the walls. So they all agreed that this is their common purpose. This is their common agenda. They want to rebuild the walls that are in ruins. So next, what was their shared measurement? It's actually kind of interesting as you read the story. So I was reading it and reading it, and something kept coming up, kept coming up. It kept mentioning beams, doors, bolts, and bars. Beams, doors, bo bolts, and bars. Tongue twister, tongue twister. Beams, doors, bolts, and bars. What does that mean? In many places, I've just highlighted two here. It says... Uh, Nehemiah 3.3, uh, 3, the fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installs it, installed its bolts and bars. Okay, then I kept reading. Another place said, the old city gate was repaired by Joada, son of Pasea, so sorry for butchering these names, and Meshulam, son of whoever. Anyways, the po point here is they laid the beams set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. If you go back to Nehemiah chapter 3, that, those four words come up again and again and again and again. So it was as though that was agreed commonly among the people that when you uh, laid the beams, set up the doors, installed bolts and bars, it's done. That part of the wall is complete. So it was a shared measurement. Because maybe someone could have come and said, well, I'm going to build the wall and they'll be, they only built it up to here. And then another person built a wall that was eight feet tall. Everybody was on a different page, right? No, they had some kind of process. They came together and said, this is what, how we measure progress. If the beams are there, the bolts, the bars, this and that, this is what we know is it is complete. It is done. That's progress, right? So that has to be a shared measurement. Next, coordinated activities. What do I mean by coordinated activities? How do we know that they had that? If you read in Nehemiah chapter 4, it says this, in verses 12 to 13, the Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed, I mean Nehemiah, placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. And if we go to the next slide, it says another verse where it says, when our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked 
while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, coats of mail, etc. What does that mean? Nehemiah is saying half the group were building the wall, half the group were fighting. But yes, they were two different functions, two different activities. But were they coordinated? Yes. That's the key. It wasn't just that some were fighting and then others were building and everyone's doing it. No, no, no. It was coordinated because ultimately it was serving that common goal, which is build the walls. It became a necessity to have some fighters because they were being attacked. So Nehemiah was said, okay, you know what? Half of you are going to continue building. Half of you are going to stand guard. And that was, again, different functions coordinated for one common goal. Okay, so we see that operational in such a beautiful way in this story. Next, continuous communication. Nehemiah was constantly speaking to the people. They were always in communication with him, and not only with him, but with the Lord. So in Nehemiah chapter 4, you read, this is just one verse. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. I uh, remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight, sorry, remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So it says constantly, and Nehemiah called them together, and Nehemiah called them together, and Nehemiah spoke to the people, and Nehemiah, so there was a constant communication between these people. It wasn't just that a couple people decided, I'm going to build a wall, and then they never talked again, and that's it. Everybody went and did their own thing. No, they were constantly communicating. They were coming together. There were attacks happening, different things. Nehemiah was build, bringing them back together to talk about things, to communicate with one another, so that they would all continue on the same flow, in the same line with one another towards that common goal. And lastly, how do we know there was backbone support? It's beautiful. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 15 to 16 says, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Nehemiah confirms that they had the support of the Lord, that God was with them. As I said, he was before them, he was with them, he was behind them, he was in every part of their activity, all their activities, they had the support of, of the Lord. And this was confirmed by that verse. And so this is just one example in the Bible that I brought that I said is a really beautiful illustration of all those concepts I said. They all sound nice, but do they actually work? Do they actually have a place in, in, in the church? Can we see them operational? And Nehemiah's story is a classic example of how when people come toward together for a common agenda with a shared measurement, with constant communication, with uh, the backbone support of the Holy Spirit, and uh, with that coordinated activities all together, truly God will give the victory. And we know it said at the very end, it didn't, it didn't just say that they had the help of the Lord, it said that their enemies were frightened. Their enemies were frightened. So not only was the work complete, the walls were built, but it ended up serving that purpose. They built the walls and the enemies were frightened. And so the victory is there when all of these things are in place. But the most important part, as I said, is this backbone support. Was the Lord supporting their efforts? Was the Lord with them through all of that? Was he a partner in all their activities? Yes. So this, the, all of that I just shared with you is really, I hope, meant to encourage you, encouraging myself, all of us, to really think about our church and the collective impact we want to have. First of all, we have to agree that it is important to have a collective impact. We can't just be isolated islands, all of us trying to reach people for the gospel by ourselves. As I said, our impact can be multiplied and magnified if we come together to try to have impact for the Lord. So first and foremost, we have to agree that we want to have a collective impact as a church. Second of all, we have to say, okay, in order to have an impact, there are a lot of things that have to happen that we as a church have to reflect on and say, yes, we need to be more in communication. We need to come and have a common agenda. We need to, you know, be, be coordinated in our activities, but yet all of us bring our different functions in the body. So all of these have to be in place and prayerfully we seek the support of the Holy Spirit in all our activities and say, Holy Spirit, may you lead us and guide us the way you know that we need to have impact on the people that you know we need to have impact on. So he needs to be a part of the equation. He can't be excluded out of the picture. So 
Again, it was meant to be a reminder, an encouragement for all of you, and complementary to what our brother Adrian shared about the importance of the body and understanding that, I'm taking it a step further today and saying, not only do we have to live and, and have a community here, we need to realize this community exists for a reason. We need to have an impact. The world needs God. The world needs to experience Christ. And so we are in a privileged position. We are in a privileged position where we can reach people for the Lord. So may that be our focus and prayer. And I, I encourage you and I challenge each of us this week, let our prayer be geared towards this. As I said, next week, the Heroes weekend is just the start of it. But that is, again, um, one of the efforts that we are taking as a church. We're coming together and taking an effort. May it be supported, number one, but may it be the beginning of the impact that we are having in this community, in this city, in the world. May this be our prayer. This week, I challenge all of us, let's be on our knees and pray about this. What impact does the Lord want us as a church to have? And how can we all find our role in that, our part? How can we bring our part? And may the Holy Spirit, again, truly be that support along the way. So I, I invite you all to stand up. I want to invite the worship team to come up.